Okay, so uh, hi, I'm Marlon Pierce, and I'm representing uh, the Apache Aravatha project. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Okay, so uh, first of all, I'd, in good Apache fashion, I'd like to thank the uh, uh, the PMC members. So, and give you a little bit of background about our project. So, um, we graduated as a top level project in September of 2012, and uh, before that, had a number of uh, fine people to serve as our uh, men, uh, champion and mentor on our incubation, uh, our incubator project. So. I'd like to especially thank uh, those people, uh, Alexander uh, Ate, uh, uh, Chris, who's uh, chairing, the, who organized the, the track here. Uh, oops, Suresh's uh, name got, font got changed. So Suresh is our uh, chair. We have a few other uh, people from the PMC in, in the audience in case there are further questions and you want to follow up a little bit. Uh, and Ross Gardler uh, was our uh, champion. So, okay, what do I want to convey, what do I want to tell you today about today, and what do I want to get out of this talk? So, I'm going to provide you with some background information, a little, a little bit of uh, context which may or may not be uh, uh, familiar to, to all of you in the audience, but I don't want that to overly constrain, I don't want our history of the project to constrain the future, I just need to tell you where we came from in order to explain why, what our Avatha is and why it does what it does. Um, but I don't want that to be, uh, and I don't want the particular communities we work with and collaborate with today to be the sum total of, of um, where we, what we'll be doing in the next couple of years. I hope in this talk that we, in, uh, by us being here at ApacheCon, that we can build better collaborations, uh, awareness, you know, is a two-way thing, awareness between uh, ourselves and the rest of, of uh, the Apache Software Foundation and what we're up to. And as we'll point out later, there are many, many uh, points of uh, connection. We, what our Avatha is and does could not exist without lots of different Apache projects that are out there right now, and we see several points of uh, collaboration. So with that said, I'm going to Remembering that history won't constrain uh, the future, uh, overly, cons overly constrain the future, I, I need to provide a little bit of background. So the first bit of background is a, a thing called cyber infrastructure, which is the, and typically a National Science Foundation terminology for distributed computing resources. So here's a nice uh, definition uh, from my grand boss, Craig Stewart at IU. And so uh, he wrote this into Wikipedia, so it became true, at least in certain versions of Wikipedia. You may have to search through uh, the version history, but basically I think this does a good job of hitting some of the highlights here. It's cyber infrastructure that consists of the computing systems, typically high performance computing systems, supercomputers, clusters, the large clusters, things like that. Data storage systems, typically here we think of mass storage systems. Uh, um, capable of storing petabytes of data on uh, archival systems of various speeds of re recovery. Advanced instruments, data repositories, scientific visualization environments, uh, and people all linked together by software and high-performance computing networks to improve research productivity and enable breakthroughs not otherwise possible. So uh, for more information about cyber infrastructure and the NSF's role in it, uh, Dan Katz, We'll be giving a presentation in this session tomorrow at, at I believe it's 2.30, and I, I encourage you to, uh, uh, to come to that. So if a lot of this sounds like, uh, you know, this is a, an NSF-centric view of, com of the computing world, if a lot of this sounds like if you're from um, NASA or the Department of Energy or DOD or places like that, you probably have seen Similar things called something, maybe not cyber infrastructure, but you've seen similar uh, things here. If you're from um, the commercial world or, or just generally uh, are paying attention, you would think of some of these things as maybe being uh, reminiscent of cloud computing and there are overlaps, but also a lot of differences that we'll, uh, we'll talk about in uh, a few upcoming slides here. So, more background, again, I don't want the, 
don't want the past overly constraining the future, but a lot of what we do is uh, sitting on top of a project, a large NSF project called Exceed, which is uh, combining uh, the forces of a lot of different academic supercomputing centers and also other, other providers, people with lots of uh, expertise in advanced academic networking, uh, software architectures for distributed systems, et cetera, et, uh, et, cetera, et cetera. So uh, Exceed is one of, the, one of the major cyber infrastructure projects that the NSF funds. And it does it in collaboration with a lot of uh, other work at individual universities and national labs. So if you're from an academic background, you might know that if you work at, uh, let's say, University of Michigan, it's not so easy to get access on, I don't want to pick on Texas, but let's say, <coughs> typically you don't get a, uh, account on a supercomputer at another university. Those university computers are purchased for that university to serve its goals and ends and professors and faculty and, and research. So uh, one of the things that Exceed is a, a facility for doing is providing allocations and accounting processes overlaid across uh, the academic computing landscape so that you can get accounts on, uh, on these other machines outside of your own home university. So uh, besides the administrative, administrative stuff and, and accounting stuff, there's also uh, a, a distributed computing problem here that I need to be able to ideally uh, run jobs from, you know, from I'm sitting in, a, in Arbor or uh, some other place. I need to be able to run jobs on these machines multiple places, say at TAC and San Diego, I need to uh, move data around as necessary or at least archive it when I'm done or need to decide whether or not I should even move data between two different uh, sites before running an, app, an application. So Exceed is uh, also providing uh, what historically is called grid middleware. So this is programming environment for you to uh, that provides some of the, the building blocks for doing the basic stuff of distributed computing across all these uh, orange states here. So these building blocks allow you to run and manage jobs, move data, move files uh, uh, better than SCP and, and or you can use SCP and if you want to uh, support single sign-on across all the sites, that sort of stuff. So Exceed does um, provide a, uh, uh, the sort of administrative overlayer and it does have a point of view of being, uh, you know, from a, it does have a resource provider point of view, but it also has a user, uh, a user point of view activity. And this is called the Science Gateway Program. So uh, Ross, even just this morning, was complaining to us about saying too much about Science Gateways on the Aravatha website, so thought I would tell you a little bit about what they are uh, before really explaining what Aravatha is and how it relates to all this stuff that I'm telling you about. Science Gateways are basically uh, designed to be uh, web services or uh, web accessible services and user interfaces that provide a more user-centric point of view to all those resources or more of an application centric point of view or a data centric point of view, a uh, scientific point of view to all those computing resources on the map in the previous slide. So a lot of what we do uh, within our Avata and within, and then also wearing our uh, Indiana University hats is to work with groups who are trying to assemble uh, these web interfaces to, uh, to all the exceed resources. I'd say another aspect of the problem is that users don't really have loyalty to exceed. Uh, users have loyalty to themselves and they'll get accounts wherever they can get accounts. If your campus has a cluster, uh, you'll use it. If that, your campus will still let you put some servers in a closet, that's what you'll do. Uh, if you get access to DOE machines, you want to use those too. 
So that's a problem that science gateways need to solve that Exceed may not care so much about, but we need to be able to bridge between Exceed and say the campus cluster or the, uh, or the nice supercomputer over in Germany that somebody wants to use. Okay, so what is Apache Aravatha? It is science gateway software that helps you uh, run scientific workflows. So it helps you compose, manage, execute, uh, and monitor the distributed computational workflows. We'll show an example of that in a minute. Uh, the building blocks of this are typically legacy command line applications installed on Exceed, Campus Cluster, maybe, maybe uh, Azure or um, uh, Amazon Cloud and so forth, but you need to be able to access or pro provides mechanisms for you to wrap those applications as, uh, as um, secure online web services. So basically it is a, it has its uh, origins in the uh, service-oriented architecture design principles of, uh, of the um, last decade. So if you think, what kind of workflows are we talking about? These are basically composing services and executing them, uh, and executing them in that distributed uh, environment. And so historically, a lot of what we're doing is uh, academic, and it came out of various NSF-funded uh, research projects. So we're a little bit, so if, uh, if you're more typical Apache software uh, found a, ApacheCon uh, attendee, uh, you may be more used to software that doesn't come from, or dealing with uh, software that doesn't come from these sorts of environments. And we got actually a lot of pushback historically when we were talking to Ross and, and other people in our, uh, uh, in our, some of our other mentors, uh, we were saying, you know, we're not sure if these academic projects belong here in Apache. And I hope we, I think Ross is, come around, I mean, he let us graduate, but I, I think he was saying even today, you know, he, he thinks it was, a, uh, it was a good decision for Apache to let us in and let others in like ODT, who maybe are not as uh, coming from the traditional places that other, uh, uh, other Apache members are coming from. And I will say, I think we definitely, as I'm gonna say here in the next few slides, we definitely need the, um, uh, the lessons of Apache, the open governance lessons within academic and uh, NSF funded software, in my personal opinion. Okay, so why do we care about Apache? So I had two reasons, then I realized I had three, but also that I might be uh, preaching to the choir here. But so the first is open governance, so we felt like within our cyber infrastructure world that software, uh, it was too, a lot of open source but not really properly open governance software. Uh, but also as I said earlier, we want to broaden our, we also want to broaden our developer community and make better connections with the rest of Apache. So the first reason, so the span, expand on this a little bit. So the first reason, uh, how open is open source software? I, th I think uh, you know, there's a lot of software on GitHub, the source for Google code and so forth. You can go look at it. But you know, uh, maybe this is obvious to everybody here, but not always obvious to people we describe this to. When you have a patch and you commit it or you want to contribute it back and do something more than just, just branching somebody's code, but really get it incorporated in, how, how does that process work? Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of software that we've seen is not as open as it should be, especially when it's uh, federally funded. So projects nevertheless can check off things that they are required to do by, uh, by funding agencies so forth. You can say I have an open source license, it's, you know, it's Apache license or it's GPL or something else I just picked from a list. Uh, you can even say, well, we are, compliant with open standards. And I like, I think, you know, 
properly done standards are, uh, in, uh, are important, but I don't think necessarily having fragmented code bases that implement those standards is a good idea. And then lastly, of course, you can even go look at the code, but as I alluded, you, you have a lot more to do than, than just this to actually build uh, an open community around your code. So one of the things we've been trying to do in Aravatha is really push uh, the open community, open governance ideas within the cyber infrastructure community. Uh, why we want to do this? Well, we feel like it, it's going to lead to better code generally, uh, but also we feel like people are still arguing about, in our community, after 15 years, are still arguing about the bricks here. And I'm really, I, I felt so depressed after supercomputing, and then I realized I had, I felt so depressed after supercomputing at the conference in November every year, this year, because we spent all the same time, and I thought, man, I, I, this is the same argument we had 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And I left supercomputing with only one really good idea, and then I realized, well, I have one good idea for a change instead of 10, so now there's a chance they'll actually implement that one idea. But it, nevertheless, we feel like, let's quit doing this. Let's quit fighting here. Everybody work from the uh, same foundation where we can all be uh, participate in the project, participate in at the PMC level, um, uh, collaborate on, on that stuff, and then compete and then use this to compete at the higher level where we can you know, provide uh, uh, you know, consulting and provide advanced services, cool add-ons and things like that. Let's figure that out instead of, instead of trying to uh, get a monopoly on the bricks. We think this will lead to better sustainability uh, because we'll have more people who can work on the code. Uh, at the same time, or more people can work on the code. You don't have the, you know, the usual Apache diversity requirements and arguments. You don't have to have, uh, if one group's funding ends or that key developer leaves, you're not, you're not screwed. You have other people who are uh, capable of stepping up. So uh, you know, if you're gonna do that though, if you're gonna have that diversity, which increases your reproducibility and sustainability and so on, you're really gonna have to figure out how to provide people with incentives to do it, uh, and you're gonna have to figure out a governance model. And so, for purposes of this audience, I'll just say, we believe that Apache's figured all of this out, or has put a lot of thought into it, at least, and there's a lot that we can learn. Uh, as I said earlier also, why are we here? What do, what do we wanna get out of this? So Arvatha has a lot of dependencies on other Apache projects, and we could not exist. Uh, we, we'd have to have done a lot of additional work to do all this stuff, and so you can you can read the list here. Uh, so, and some collaboration opportunities, things we need to do while we're here uh, is uh, find uh, good points of, and so it, some of this will be, make more sense in a minute when I work through walk, walk through a use case, but find. Uh, some concrete points of collaboration within not just the earlier points, which some, at some level we can just treat it as libraries, but also find uh, where we need to, uh, points where we need to uh, work in more of a contributor mode or, or find contributors from different parts of Apache. So we have a lot of, so there's a lot of OOD tests, uh, talks in, in this track, so I won't say anything about that. Um, actually, this, some of these things will make more sense after I actually show you what Aravatha does. So now let's put all this stuff together, all of our background, and show you an example problem. So re I'll remind you again, this is Exceed. These are the resources. Machines all over the place, big machines, uh, big storage, big networks. Each machine is a very, it's a very heterogeneous environment. It's not anything like a cloud. Uh, machines are very specialized. Machines are, different machines are very good for doing things uh, of different sorts. So they all have very high speed interconnections. Some also have massive 
mounts of memory, some have GPUs attached to them, and so on. So let's start with a sample problem. Let's simulate the universe. So what's that? Yeah. So you got to start somewhere. So, um, so I, everybody, I'm sure, has heard of dark energy and dark matter. Uh, and uh, unless uh, anybody is an astrophysicist or cosmologist and wants to jump up and, and explain this, I'll, I'll just do my best to muddle through it. But so this is a project, a consulting project that was, uh, that came to us wearing our exceed hats from uh, Gus Everard at University of Michigan and, and uh, Alex uh, Kropstoff at the University of Chicago. So uh, you, you can read the slide here, but so basically the Dark Energy Survey is an upcoming uh, international experiment that is gonna be designed to probe the properties of, um, you know, what's, why, do, why do our theories not have most of the mass and most of the energy? That we can observe, or we can um, that we obtain uh, through observational measurements. So we're not working. So dark energy survey is a large project, lots and lots of people. We're specifically working with the simulations working group, who is so before the instrument comes online, you want to generate a bunch of sample data sets, and so there are lots of competing theories about what the source of dark energy is, and so. What you can do is say, well, if this theory is right, you'll see something like this. If that theory is right, you'll see something like this, and so forth. And so it's a, without getting into the details of, of all that you're doing, I'll just say that is basically, the simulation working group is there in part to help the people who are gonna be doing the analysis of the real data to figure out what they should be seeing once the instrument becomes available. So to do this, is a fairly substantial amount of computing. So the workflow so is composed of, in our case, composed of individual components. So uh, here are three that are the core part of the dark energy survey uh, workflow. And again, I'm assuming that nobody here is an uh, astrophysicist and I don't need to go into too much detail. I just, for your amusement, I would point out that, um, well, you know, A, they're still using Fortran, but also uh, the output here from the first code is a few kilobytes. Uh, when you go through the second step uh, for actually computing the initial conditions for the whole simulation, you've gone to uh, a few tens or hundreds of gigabytes, which is inconvenient not massive anymore, but it's certainly inc inconvenient for uh, uh, slinging around the, the web in a, in, a, in a timely fashion. And then by the time you've actually run uh, one of the main simulations, you've generated tens of terabytes of data. So workflow is basically gonna be to bolt those together and, and put in some intermediate steps. Uh, Essentially, it's a, if, essentially this, is, this is a, going to be a directed acyclic graph. So this is not the, not the in store, that DAGs are not the in story of, of workflows, but this is a good example of one where you, you do have one. Uh, there's still some, uh, still some issues in, in running these types of simulations as a, as a workflow, so what are some of the problems that we have to incorporate into the Aravatha code to uh, do these types of workflows? One thing is that especially that last code is gonna run for uh, many, many days and take on, on uh, 1024 cores on a machine that's no longer available on Exceed. I don't know, how long, does it, how long does this take to run on trestles? About. So that's the download and the yeah. and the, it's ready to run on Stampede. Stampede. Okay. So, Exceed is not a cloud, so we actually know the names of the machines and, <laughs> and, have, to, and have to worry about how to port code. Yeah. Is that your laptop? So, um, <laughs> longer than the age of the universe, so kind of get into a problem there. 
Uh, so also, so one of the problems is, of course, uh, we have to be able to support restart and because um, just the detail here, the queues don't, don't let you uh, run for that jobs for three to five days on, on some of the resources. Um, also, we needed to do things, we need additional construction, you know, constructs within the workflow like do while that are not necessarily uh, uh, compliant with the DAG, DAG ideology. Data sizes are go from tiny to inconvenient to enormous or, or really inconvenient, I guess petabytes are enormous. But um, also, uh, if you just bolt a bunch of codes together and, and don't pay too much attention to, to what happens, you'll generate 10,000 files all trying to do I.O. at the same time, which will crash the, um, the uh, uh, high performance file system, luster file system that uh, all the uh, machines on the supercomputer use. So anyway, let me break out of that just for a minute and show you. So this is a, this is what the whole thing looks like in Ornavatha. This is actually an older version of the user interface. So uh, as I, also as I say in a minute, we, this is what you, uh, the interface that you'll get out of the box just so you can see something and use something. It's, it's versions of this have been around for quite some, this particular GUI have been around for quite some time and uh, we're certainly trying to f get away from <coughs> Uh, this particular interface in the future and also make it easier to build newer things, but this is good enough for now. So this is basically uh, a couple slides back I had three codes and so there's L gadget and um, the, the, the step one of the workflow and so forth. So these things here, these boxes are web services that allow you to talk to the supercomputer that runs that particular application uh, and then we're incorporating, this is a thing that incorporates the do while uh, construct, and then we have inputs and outputs. So if you thought about it, this looks like this will be a DAG. So basically this is a quick movie. Uh, we're gonna uh, start the uh, code. This is providing input uh, at the first step over here, or actually here. So. Uh, the code runs, and so we're going to step through here. The messages at the bottom are basically uh, events coming through the Aravatha uh, messaging bus as uh, various uh, state changes occur. So this is not necessarily the most human readable thing, but it's useful for us as a, as a um, debugging and uh, development tool. So eventually here, this code will finish and the next code will launch and so forth and then this one runs for uh, four days. So we won't show the whole thing. And so eventually the next step will go and, uh, and eventually we will be done. So, So I should move along here. So we've applied this. So basically, there are some special requirements coming out of our as, uh, out of the dark energy survey problem. But we actually encounter these things, these general types of problems that need to combine codes together uh, to do something that wasn't originally intended in several different scientific domains. And so we've uh, applied our Vatha and and its some of its predecessor codes to all sorts of all sorts of things. So a little bit about um, our uh, project culture. So this is a Java code base. And um, it is at uh, version 0 0.6 is out. Um, version 0 0.7 is uh, in preparation. So one of the things that we still try and figure out, or a couple of things we still try and figure out in the project is one, number one, what, what's in a release? So 0 0.6 took a while to get out um, because in part, uh, because we tried to do too much and put too much stuff in it. The, just trying to give you an idea of, of how, thing, how the project works here. So basically one of the things that we're looking for 
advice on and to learn from other people in the community is, you know, is it good just to have, should I just have a monthly or every two month or whatever release and then I just roll it and, you know, we're, we're good with whatever, whatever bugs we fixed and we make sure that there are no, you know, that everything's working or should we drive it more from, you know, here's the features that we absolutely have that, you know, that we need to have there. Another thing we're trying to do is uh, uh, you know, a lot of projects have uh, that we uh, that we collaborate with or, or work with are really successful using uh, Sprint and Scrum uh, approaches, and we're uh, trying to figure out how to uh, do that within our project uh, while at the same time um, uh, complying with Apache uh, uh, Apache openness. About how about how things are about how the sprints are assembled and who works in the sprints and those sorts of things. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved, I, you know, um, get on the dev list. You can easily find that out. Uh, we work through Jira. Um, so one the thing issue one issue though that Suresh actually has a nice presentation about had a nice presentation about yesterday was um, how do people what's the best way to really get involved especially if you're a student. So we've had a, a nice uh, bit of success from uh, Google Summer of Code last summer when, in three good projects, one of which was, granted, we knew the developer and really recruited him, but we got a really good, uh, at least one really good contribution here. And also Shahani, uh, who's here today, is uh, uh, doing a good job of, of identifying uh, student projects within her, at her university. and, and setting up the uh, you know master's level um, projects but so you know how do you really jump in what I've seen in this project and other projects is you know if you just start at the JIRA that's not the right place so uh, you might get the wrong idea or you might pick something that um, it's either a stale item it's a stale idea that somebody had a long time ago or it's it's uh, you know it, it may not be their best thing so we need to think of I don't have an answer for this. I, I just say we need to do a better job or think a better, uh, think more deeply about how best to tell you if you want to show up on the doorstep and do something that's both useful and and, and not going to get uh, railroaded by the uh, by our release train once we get it going every six weeks. Then then uh, you know what what to tell you what you should do. Another issue, another thing we try to uh, think about is we want to engage. Users through our uh, wearing our other hats, uh, like, like when we uh, uh, collaborate with Exceed and, and find new uh, new people to work with, we want to treat them like collaborators. Uh, one issue is uh, a lot of the other. Well, one issue is a lot of the cyber infrastructure people on, that we collaborate and compete with are uh, not quite coming around to or quite getting their heads around the whole Apache thing. But the other thing is that, of course, if you look at Gus Everard and his group, you know, uh, Java for Science, I think, was not, you know, that died in maybe 2000, 1999. So, you know, those are Python programmers, C, even Fortran programmers. programmers. So what does it mean if you have a really good collaboration like we have with people, but they're not really going to be doing a lot of core contributions. You know, what we need to decide, I know this is, uh, we could declare whatever we want to declare now that we're a top level project, but I really think we need to internally come up with uh, good decisions about how we want to engage uh, collaborators who are not necessarily gonna contribute lots of code, but still say, you, you know, here's what you, if you wanna be on the PMC, here's what you need to do. Mm, sure. What time? Small as a stupid big data uh, trend, but it has nothing to do with big data really. I mean, it's just about sort of how we make big communities you know, collaborate with each other and get sort of 
Your, apol your apology is alone, yeah, taking your time. I was going to say, it depends on those communities like, that you work in. Like, case in point, I had a big problem with Seek at mm -hmm. some point because an SCDF novel library wasn't on uh, Biblio or on, not Biblio, on Save and Central. And so I could have, you know, done different things. I could have forked that, made my own project, pissed a bunch of people off, and then, you know, got it on there myself. Uh, what, we ended, what I ended up doing was I worked with, you know, NCAR, UCAR, which aren't even part of Apache, mm -hmm. but to figure out how to get them to publish their stuff to Maven Central, and I did it by adding Maven capabilities to their AMP script that they didn't have any Maven skills to do, and they didn't have the resources, and so that bought me a little bit of credit, and they're like, yeah, we don't care, and we're, yeah, we're an upstream project from you, and we're willing to do this. Yeah. So it just depends, like, how you want to act, actively engage with the community, you know, for that, and what the different models, like some communities won't let you do that, and then you have to proliferate for unfortunately, and, you know. Yeah, that, that's actually a whole bunch of other issues, too. Yeah. Like, you know, you want to work with another project, uh, Unicorn is one I'll pull out, so, you know, they, they made it, you know, they're not Apache, they, they're they open source, they're fine, you know, I don't complain about their license, but, you know, they're going to have, you know, how, do we, how are we going to, um, they have a plugin they want to give us, but now they have their version of jars, and so, you know, so maybe those jars are uh, incompatible. You know, maybe they're going to have incompatible dependencies. Uh, so, it, or 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 even worse, um, you know, we have to talk to some. We have to go through some bureaucratic process to get the code in the right repository with the right license. The, the class path problems are nothing compared to to working with people who have ties on. Nobody's wearing a tie. Okay, good. Nobody has a tie on. Good. So now I'm going to uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to bring it home and then turn it over to Saminda in just a minute. I wanted to uh, I gave you an overview, and Saminda's going to go into greater detail about these parts. But I gave you a, I gave you a view of what the um, art about to look like, or at least one part of it looked like doing the dark energy survey stuff. This slide is all the components. So basically, you have your dark energy survey codes installed on these machines. Uh, and those are wrapped with uh, a thing called GFAC, or the Application Wrapping Factory. It makes, uh, makes each one of these a network accessible service. So you know, one code per, per GFAC there, or per, per uh, GFAC developed um, or wrapped service, and then uh, the interface here, you know, might depend upon, this might be a cloud, this might be talking to, uh, to a PBS-based scheduling and queuing system, it might be talking to uh, Globus Graham, Unicor, Condor, whatever, so we have to have different providers here. Um, so when you're, uh, the first step, of course, is to compose your workflow. You can do that visually with the XBEA user interface. Um, so you'll wrap all these applications and then you'll combine them into your workflow when you actually get ready to execute the workflow. That's done by the in interpreter service. Uh, the <coughs> interpreter service is the thing that pushes through the DAG and maintains most of, the, most of the system state. There's some inevitable state here because we have a running application. Uh, the workflows, after they get defined, are put in, in all this metadata here. It goes into a, a registry service. The, um, after the workflow is run, the workflow instance also goes into the registry. As things are happening, you saw the, the messages at the bottom of the XBA interface, all that, all that state change information, all those other messages are going to the message box. So that's our Avatha, and I would say everything here is really up for grabs now for improvements. So um, Application Factory, we've recently put a lot of work in, into this, Laru, who's uh, being, uh, Back at IU, uh, doing stuff, uh, working on this is uh, been refactoring this because we got some nice GSOC requirements on how to uh, integrate with the with Apache Were and uh, 
on cloud jobs, but it, it made some, uh, it brought out some architectural problems with, our, with GFAC that needed to be fixed. Uh, the registry has gone through just within, since we've gone to Apache, we've gone through two different versions of this, trying to get this right. And, and we know we don't have it right because we need to do a better, we need to connect with, uh, with Yolanda and uh, Gills and, uh, and the ODT uh, work on uh, provenance standards, which are not in here yet. Uh, message box, this is a pub, just a classic publish subscribe uh, system compatible with WS notification, WS eventing. Uh, messaging has gone a long way. People are, got their heads around it finally, maybe, I don't know, five years ago, and so now, consequently, they, uh, there's lots of good, within Apache and outside Apache, lots of good messaging software. Uh, that we could use here. Uh, and certainly, and then the other la la last thing is that we've uh, taken a lot of the stuff that was in, embedded in this Java Web Start out interface and really, this has been done uh, primarily by Sununda, really put a lot of work into the API, which is not a thin API, but there's a lot of stuff that goes on in all these different parts working together and talking to these different parts. And so this API is really attempted to simplify and provide a single entry point for, uh, uh, for developers here to hide a lot of the details, but it, it, it basically, uh, it took a lot of work and I won't claim that we have, we've implemented a, two or three different substantial projects with it, but it certainly could uh, use more people looking at it and complaining about it. So with that, let me turn over to Sununda, and I'm going to skip these wonderful slides. But they're a nice little animation in case you ever wanted to see that description in more, uh, in more detail. Uh, I'll be explaining uh, on uh, mostly on the developer perspective of uh, uh, what's it to be uh, part of the Ayurveda community. So, uh, th so the reason like we have this part of the presentation is that like you all been contributing to the Ap Ap uh, Apache projects. So, what's so different in if you're contributing to the Ayurveda? So, apart from the usual benefits you get from contributing to Apache projects, you actually have a different uh, perspective when you're actually working with the community. So a uh, couple of things uh, here we have to note down is uh, uh, mainly uh, we have the idea of actually playing with more than one technology. So for example, if you take some uh, uh, Apache project related to web services, you will have everything related to how to work with web services. But in a case like Ayurvata, you have several different frameworks, not only web services, you work with the database systems, messaging frameworks, uh, security uh, layouts, and whole quite a lot of uh, tools relating to uh, formatting, uh, conversion, stuff like that. So, uh, th so the most important thing is that you're not going to spe be, uh, specialize each of them, but you get to touch everything uh, when you actually start working on it. Um, so in my, myself, I started working on Nairavata itself like uh, just over a year ago. I only started uh, using only the graphical side of Nairavata. You have a client where you can actually work with uh, adding and removing, composing, how to change those stuff. But starting from that point onwards, I was able to uh, work on the uh, various types of technologies say Apache. Uh, so here, then the another thing is that like the it's not only the Apache uh, way of things. We have actually have the some part of uh, academia involved over here. So you all have heard of uh, various sorts of computing resources. Uh, the grids, the cloud, the EC2 instances, uh, using Hadoop, st stuff like that. So <coughs> is it like really possible to actually uh, try to work with them at the same time? Uh, usually in a project when you're working on it, you look, uh, start working only on a single project. But in here, we get the chance to actually explore uh, all of those things if you want. And even like if you have something new, you, you can actually get to experiment and actually contribute stuff like that as well. But the most interesting thing I saw in the uh, community is that uh, 
the community itself right now what you have is not just the developers, you actually have the scientists as well. The scientists come on and actually ask, okay, can I do this, can I do that? And another really cool thing about those scientists is some of them are actually developers. They know what they want, uh, they just need some help to do it. So when we actually work with them, we actually get the perspective of, okay, what's the actual real problem? We know that there's a problem, we try to solve it in some way, but the thing is that while we are doing it, usually we actually lose track of uh, what we actually have to solve. We try to solve the problem, not for the, uh, the actual user, but in a more theoretical perspective. So uh, let's uh, look at some of the things uh, we actually uh, gain from the community. So Ayurveda is a fairly new uh, top level project. I graduated pretty recently. So uh, I'm going to explain some of the things. Actually, Marlon explained a couple of them. Uh, which actually we uh, got in Ayurvata project in the last uh, eight to 10 months. Um, so one thing is this, uh, we have the ability to uh, have a customizable registries. So uh, Ayurvata itself, even though it's a workflow engine, it, it accumulates a lot, quite a lot of data. Uh, some of the inputs and sometimes configuration data, management data, sometimes uh, data from the actual applications itself, the results. So all those data needs to go somewhere. So earlier what we had is uh, we had a database uh, plugged into our system. Uh, uh, so we call it the registry and put, we put all those data into that registry. But later on the community came up and said, okay, I, I need the results of my experiment, but it, it's not really accessible in the way you are operating because you, you will have your own server in your place, but I want the data in my server. Or sometimes some, some people came and say, okay, this is not the exact date I need to be uh, say, process it further, or I want to save it in a separate way, or do some other stuff. So in that way, right, figure out, okay, we shouldn't actually just go and dump the data as it is in the database. We should allow the people to actually make use of uh, their own way of saving the data. So what we came up with is that, uh, with the help of the community itself, uh, we define some kind of an interface where that you can actually go ahead and say, uh, okay, uh, send me the data, I'll, I'll take care of the whole thing. So it's virtually you can actually do anything with the data once it comes into the Apache Ayurveda. You just have to in implement that interface uh, so that you can actually, uh, the data will be passed to you and when the system ba asks back the data, you have to get, get, give back the data. So, uh, so this is one of the GSOC projects uh, where you actually uh, had the functionality of Hadoop incorporated into uh, Ayurveda. Uh, this was actually uh, implemented pretty recently, uh, close to like a month ago. So one of the important thing about this is that like before this was implemented, we had, uh, we had to actually completely re-architect uh, architect the whole pl place where uh, the whole the computing resources get called, how it is being called. So the thing is that uh, in order to do that, the whole part over there in the Apache Ayurveda, where you, you see the icon where the wheel, had to be refactored. Uh, so this refactoring occurred, not actually based on the idea of us, but from the community. They actually said, okay, these are the different ways of being, we need this way of configuring stuff. So it's based on their idea and actually based on patches from them. We actually got this refactored and then we actually added the, this Hadoop part there. And uh, as Marlon explained, so we have an API right now so we, all, we do have an, a graphical interface called XBIA to actually work with the Ayurveda, but most of the time, as I said, it's the scientists who are working, and they are not actually uh, uh, people who are comfortable with the computer science terms. Uh, so our XBIA is mostly catered for the computer uh, people who actually knows about those things, but uh, usually uh, the scientists will have their own application with their own uh, domain context. So. They will have their own developers. Perhaps sometimes they themselves are developers. They will want to talk with Ayurveda in their own terms. So that's why we have an Apache Ayurveda API where uh, you can do virtually anything related to the Ayurveda project except for actually composing the workflows where you actually have to use the XBI in that case uh, to run, monitor, retrieve the data, uh, all those stuff. And uh, so we recently actually uh, started uh, drilling down the security requirements of Ayurveda. Uh, so here, uh, what we have is uh, a typical use case we, uh, we try to solve, uh, a problem we have uh, where 
you have a specific set of data users who's trying to uh, run some applications in the whatever the computational resource, for example, in the grid. The, the problem is that like those users need to run as a specific user in the community uh, in the, the read, using read credentials, but uh, we are not uh, supposed to actually give those credentials to those users. It's just that they have the rights to run it only. So there should be some sort of mapping from those set of users to the actual users who are actually running the application. So the problem here is that like it's not the case just single complete mapping. There are cases where you have to map the sessions and how they ex get expired, how they get mapped, how, how, how can they get changed, uh, the updates, the, how the roles get mapped. So there's a huge uh, spectrum of issues over there, which the normal usual scientists won't see, but in a computer science perspective, you have to solve. So in that sense, uh, uh, so one of the things we came up with is something called a credential store, where uh, you actually how to man manage two different kinds of credentials, how stuff, uh, how to actually uh, cater the two entities uh, in a proper manner in the security context. So uh, apart from that, we have uh, several other ideas as well. Some of them are actually still in the patch mode, the half-baked mode, and some of them are actually in, still in the drawing, drawing board. But still, uh, but still, all these are actually coming up from the community that they requested, that the ideas they gave. So why these are really cool ideas is that it's actually uh, relevant for the real science applications, the, for the real world. So, uh, so you may not be actually still interested in actually using Airavata itself or just contributing stuff, but that's fine. Uh, because Apache uh, Airavata will actually give you uh, stuff for free, even if you're not using Airavata. So for example, this generic application factory, which Marlon mentioned as the GFAC. So you can, if you say you want to run some application in the grid or in the EC or in the cloud, you don't have to write the code from scratch. You can just make use of the library and do the call yourself. Same way you have a PubSub messaging system where you can subscribe and do the messaging on uh, WS notifications. And you have the credential store, which I explained a little while ago. and um, so one of the main key points on uh, Hyderabad these days on, among students is how they actually get introduced into the open source world. So uh, I'm sure like if, if you were there in the yesterday's talk where the Shehani and Suresh explained how, how prominent that the users are, uh, students are right now engaging on this. And uh, well, it, apart from the GSOC where you actually get paid, the students right now actually come and ask, okay, uh, I would really like to work on this. It's mainly because they see that it's a good opportunity for their research for future academia. Right, so those are things that so far in the community we see, okay, the things that uh, that has grown in uh, to actually create a lot of opportunities. So you can also join in if you want. So the, there are several ways, so we already have uh, Apache projects actually been combined, so most of things actually, uh, some of them actually combined using the patches from the committee itself, some of these we also implemented, but you can also do the same thing. Uh, you might be actually working in your own projects, Apache projects, you can just go ahead and uh, see, okay, how can your project can be applicable for the Apache Airavata? Or how can Airavata can be applicable for your project? Just make the connection and you might be able to enhance both the projects itself in the same time. But it doesn't have to be any projects. You can just come up with your own ideas. We also have a stack of uh, ideas, actually, that's just waiting to be implemented in the system, which will enhance the whole uh, experience for the scientists and a good uh, learning curve for you. So th these are not the only things. There, there are some other stuff as well. So these are like from the place where you have the GUI tools up to the whole uh, multi-tenancy, everything. Over to Marlon. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll, just a couple more slides. So, um, one other thing that we want to do uh, is make it as easy as we can for people to get access to it. So, I guess one thing we realized is that you know, even if you go through the stringent Apache release process, people will still fail to get your code to work. Um, so, no, it's true. It's really true. <laughs> yeah. It's relatively stringent. 
<laughs> stringent, more stringent than some. Uh, so we're working on a, um, so we are working uh, on a uh, nice uh, cloud-based configurable thing where you can get a, basically a cloud, a web interface to a cloud studio for creating and managing Arvata images. And I'm not gonna say too much about that. That's still in development. And I promise there'll be pictures of donuts at the end. So uh, here's all the information uh, that you might want to be interested in. Uh, there's also a YouTube uh, presentation with up to maybe 45 views at this point on how this relates to cyber infrastructure and I'll take questions. Any, thank you very much, are there any questions? If there are, some in the blinds room. Sure. Oh yeah, I googled voodoo donuts and, and the, the maple bacon came right up. <laughs> okay, I had one question, sorry, I have to pull it mm -hmm. up in my notes. So earlier on, so great talk. Thank you. Um, Earlier on, there was a mention, and uh, I think it was like your astronomy workflow that you guys had to do like a do while or something, and mm -hmm. that it wasn't, that's not like, um, or amenable to DAGs or things like that. Mm -hmm. So when you said we have to do a do while, like who was the we there? Was it like, do the scientists that you're working with care about those constructs? Are they actually like designing them? Or is it really like you guys as sort of the data ops or science ops team or whatever you know you call yourselves, mm -hmm. is it you guys that had to worry about that? Uh, so I'll, I'll answer that as best I can. And, and Reminder here uh, actually was the uh, main uh, point of contact on that particular project and, and can uh, provide more detail later. But so. Basically, this is uh, something that we do in, consulta in consul consultation with that group. So we figure out, what are you doing? And then you tell us, and then we say, tell us again what you're doing. And, and then, you know, so we go through this process. So each of these workflows, you know, ideally, when you see these things, you say, okay, well, I'm gonna drag and drop and bolt all these things together and away it goes. But the reality is that um, it takes a while to, you know, really get your head around what the science cases and map that to what the workflow toolkit can do or can't do. So it's so the do while in this particular case I've, I'm actually drawing a, a little bit of a um, uh, a little bit of blank on, on the specific specifics of it but I mean it's basically this was not the only time when such things occur where you need to have uh, or no, sorry this in this particular case it was because of uh, the uh, checkpointing, so you don't really know when the code's going to be finished, and it's definitely not going to—it's definitely going to take longer than than the default queue time. And so we had to basically uh, get checkpointing built in. Uh, but there are other types of constructs, constructs like uh, you know, um, uh, for each and so forth that uh, that need to be incorporated. So the do while in this particular case was more driven up from the from the bottom of of you know what. What the constraints are on the uh, environment, the okay. environment. Okay. So, Rush, you had a comment? But if I guess what you're doing, maybe you're doing without say, this is probably a particular example of where the TMT has to create a consulting view to that. But I would say, the other example, what Saminda was pointing out, like the database extension, the coding a reach to it. So, that was just the community asking for it, and not only asking for it, like with the guidance of it, they implemented that. Yeah, okay. So, that was the other good example that they didn't get that uh, one, but uh, so see, like, so I think. Makes sense. Yeah. So in this case, you could say, well, if you write, if you define your community right, it would be a community-driven requirement. So, so this is really, this is really coming from, you know, you could think of it as coming from the exceed middleware. It's just those guys didn't give us the requirement. It just came out of uh, Gus and, and his. What residents. they didn't give you the requirement? Just kidding. <laughs> no, they're 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 in, they're in the 18th month of their. Sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> We're being taped. I, I better not say anymore. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other? Okay. Uh, one more question. I think yeah, there's I a minute left. Hopefully, this is a quick question. Oh, no, Roman, you just under the mic. Oh, okay. Sorry. 
Yeah, great talk. Uh, quick question, hopefully. Uh, so a lot of concepts that you highlighted, you know, it seems like there is a great overlap with what Hadoop community is grappling with because, you know, fundamentally it's all about like, you know, managing resources and, you know, workflows and queues and all that jazz, you know, user identity, right? Like the only difference seems to be that, you know, in Hadoop's case, the resources are, you know, slightly more sort of uh, under your control and in your case, you know, the resources like all over the place. So my question is, you know, what level of sort of cross-pollination exists between the two projects? So the, 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 mic the microphone, maybe. So I think that, yeah, so the, the short answer is, yeah, when, we, when we're getting ready to, yeah, when we're getting ready to, to come here and, and do this, we said, okay, you know, let's, let's, let's give, a, what, which I was trying to convey in the first slides, let's give a point of view. So the, the short answer is not a lot, and, but, the, but we really want to. That's why we're, you know, that's what we want to get out of this talk is identify where we should be, who we should be talking to, who else in Apache is doing stuff that's that's relevant, where we can make a contribution or or, or develop a new collaboration. Yeah, and I definitely think that you know Hadoop. When I say Hadoop, I don't really mean you know HDFS and MapReduce because HDFS is kind of like you know maybe sort of slightly useless to you guys. I actually much more can you know much more interested in sort of higher level things that sit, sit on top of Hadoop like Uzi. I mean Uzi is a, essentially a general purpose, you know, workflow management system, right? You know, like maybe it could be useful for you guys as well, you know, things like that. Yeah. Kafka, you know, that sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, actually there is a, um, and that's a place on my map, San Diego Supercomputing Center, they have a new, uh, they have a machine called Gordon with my Hadoop available from it because they had, you know, they're getting science users who want to use Hadoop and, you know, it's, so it's, it's more appropriate for data parallel uh, scientific computing problems where you have lots of data and you want to do the same thing to it, you know, of course. So as opposed to uh, more of the classic scientific computing that uh, the dark energy rep survey represents. Yeah. But yeah, we're definitely, so maybe you should, well, the next speaker comes up, I'll just say, uh, from our point of view, yeah, we need to find what higher level stuff we could do on top of Hadoop because that's where a lot of our scientific community, a lot of, cl uh, potential collaborators are right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.